Tonight I'm going to talk about demonized Christians. Is it possible that demons can be in Christians? That seems to be the, the question of the hour. Some people just cannot bring themselves to believe that nice, lovely, fluffy Christians could have demons. But I'll tell you what, the people who disclaim the deliverance ministry and say, well, it's not really necessary, they're the ones who need deliverance the most. Did you know that? When I first came into this ministry nearly 18 years ago, 18, it's 18 years ago, I guess now, when I went around the country, when I started traveling around the country, especially people would ask me, they say, do you think that everybody has demons? I said, I don't know. I haven't met everybody yet. <laughs> but all the people that I met had a load. And they don't come singly. They come in bunches, great big bunches. They come by the legion. You see, one of the awful things in our day, the things that is causing so much chaos today, is the woeful underestimating of the enemy. Now, it's a mistake to overestimate your enemy, and we're certainly not to live in fear. There's a scripture on the wall that says God has not given us a spirit of fear. We're not to live in fear, but we ought to be alert to the dangers of the enemy. And he has infiltrated absolutely everything in this world system. There is no part of society, there's no part of the economic, political, religious structure that he has not infiltrated with some of his work. And the believers are the only hope to get this thing changed. And there have been times in our history in the past when it looked as if there was no hope whatsoever. And it looked as if disaster was right on there. And this, by the way, this is one of those years. It looks worse than any year since I've lived on the earth. But you know, when it's when the devil does his worst, that's when it's time for God to do his best. We've seen God's faithfulness so many times around here. If there were no need for deliverance ministry, then all the problems that the believers have could be simply solved by surrendering, by praying, by reading the Bible, by repeating the Bible by just going through some little religious platitudes and everybody would be happy and we'd all be filled with power and we'd crush the head of the serpent and march bravely on. But unless you're just some Pollyanna that doesn't have a lick of sense, you know that's not happening. The believers are under tremendous siege. There's an open warfare going on. All leaves have been canceled and everybody is to be at the battlefront. The tragedy is... When some people come to the battlefront, all they bring is their toys because they've never been taught to fight, only to play. They play religious games. They bring their cantata sheets. Well, I'll guarantee you the devil's not worried about your cantata. I've heard some of them I think he helped fix. But they, uh, the devil is not worried about religious toys and games. They don't bother him. As a matter of fact, they're a good detraction, a, a dis, uh, distraction to keep you from getting down to business with the Lord. Do Christians have demons? Well, now, nasty people might. But does a spirit-filled, born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, prophesying, tongue-interpreting, word of wisdom, wisdom and knowledge given to those kind of gracious, wonderful people, to those who lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They couldn't have demons, no way. Well, unless they're not members of the human race, they've got them. There's only been one person on this earth who ever lived who could say truthfully, Satan has nothing in me. And that was Jesus Christ. All the rest are liars. And I've heard some people say and say it on television. 
I had seven demons cast out, and of course now I'm completely delivered. So I'll give them two eye rolls on that. Oh my. You're woefully underestimating the enemy, and the deception is so widespread, and the pride and the arrogance that comes through. We must dump this overboard. God is sick and tired of this. This is why he's allowed things to come to this awful pass in our day of disaster facing us on every hand and spiritual calamity coming because his people must be shocked into coming back to the verities of the faith and dumping overboard the religious garbage they've picked up and all the religious toys must go overboard. The ship is sinking. It's no time to say, let's let's everybody get our combs and put a piece of paper on it and sing everything's all right. It's not all right. It's in bad shape, but there is a remedy. It's to cast out those things which have invaded. Now, of course, people have such a terrible time admitting that they have demons. They want you to get lost so you can have demons. And if they walked in here and you were thrashing around on the floor and demons were screaming coming out of you, they'd walk up and say, well, they're lost. Now, wouldn't you like to get saved again? How are you going to do that? Did you know that if you ever managed to get loose from salvation, you'd never get it back? That's in Hebrews 6. It says that if it were possible, didn't say it was, just said if it were, you'd never make it back. You better just hang on to what you got. Or let it hang on to you because it will anyhow. And I'll tell you this, you can jump the track with God if you want to. But once you're hooked on his train, did you ever see a, a, a train, a big locomotive pulling along a bunch of railroad cars? Supposing the railroad car on the end says, I don't want to run on this old stupid track. It's too straight, and I want to do my own thing, and I'm just going to jump my wheels off the track. What's going to happen to that stupid car? Well, unless the train turns loose, that car is not going to be running on the rails anymore. And you know what's under, what, what you run on if you're not on the rails? You run on the cross ties. That car is not designed to run on cross ties. It's designed to run on rails. If you get on the cross ties, what's going to happen to that coach? It's going to be torn all to pieces. I've got news for you. You hitched up. And you say, I'm not going to walk God's way. Congratulations. Prepare to come apart at the seams. The cross ties are coming. And, And the train is speeding up, by the way. You say, well, turn me loose, turn me loose. He's not going to. You belong to him. He's bought you with a tremendous price. Now, just get get it out of your mind that you're going to get loose. You might as well dump that overboard. That's over, finished. That was finished at Calvary. And you're not going to undo the work of Almighty God. You say, but I don't want to be a Christian. Tough. And you've heard me tell my famous story, too, of one of my children I confronted one time when we were having some difficulties and and, uh, she looked at me and she said but dad I don't want to be holy and I said my dear there's no danger (laughs) and I feel like that about Christians who say but I don't want to walk with Jesus there's no danger you don't make any you don't look like you're walking with Jesus but it's going to beat you to death and your family and everybody's connected with you is going to be take an awful beating but you're not going to get loose now Let's look over at uh, 2 Corinthians, verse 11, and, uh, excuse me, chapter 11. 2 Corinthians was written because Paul feared for the deception of the enemy to come in. Now, who were the Corinthians? Were they lost people or saved people? They were saved people, and a lot of them are living like lost people. Check 1 Corinthians. And in the first Corinthian letter, Paul took hide, guts, and feathers. I mean, he, he, I mean, he cleaned house. And when he got through, I mean, he had exposed every era in the country. Now, 
when uh, he got through, he did such a good job, the church reversed its position and repentance took place on a wholesale scale as a result of the first Corinthian letter. I mean, they got right. And I, I would have loved to have been there. I know they had a demon spitting contest because before that they were having prophesying contests. After that they were spitting up religious spirits that were making them do all that. Making running races, see who could prophesy the most, see who could interpret tongues, who, who could pray in tongues the most and all that. And Paul wrote back and straightened them out. And then he got on to them about immorality being in their midst. And he didn't mince any words about it. He just chewed them out. But well, the church reversed and it got back on trail with a vengeance. And then some of the people that had been guilty of some of the things that were charged repented and wanted to come back. And they said, no, you're not nasting up our place anymore. Forget it. We got in trouble once, that preacher over there, by getting you back. No way. We're not going to have another letter coming in here eating us alive. No. You just stay outside. And they wouldn't let him back. So Paul wrote the second Corinthian letter and said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Take the foot off the brake now. We've got the situation under control. Give them a chance. If they want to repent, give them a chance. If they still don't repent, you can always toss them out. Now, and when he comes to, uh, and the, the theme of the whole second Corinthian letter is Paul concern lest they be deceived by the enemy. Once they were deceived into being too loose, they were loose as a goose, just fluttering all over the place. Then he got them tightened up and they were so tight, he said, loosen up a little bit. Because he said, now you've gone to the other extreme, you're so legalistic, you won't let anybody do anything. Loosen up and let people walk with the Lord. Lest you, let the enemy come in that way and take advantage of you. You can go either way. There is a ditch on the right hand side. There's a ditch on the left hand side of the road. But you need to be somewhere in that road in the middle. Now here at Hegwish, we sit right on that, the middle of that white line. Right in the middle. Other people are off one way or the other. But we will tell them, come on, get up here with us where we are. No, not really. But we need to at least be on the road. Wouldn't you say that? I mean, when you get over there and you hear your wheels striking the gravel, you're off the road. Come on, get back, in the, get back on the main line. Get back on the road. And that's what Paul is telling him in the 2 Corinthian letter. And he, in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he said, uh, verse 2, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you, I have betrothed you, I have engaged you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. He said the reason I went on the warpath was because I saw the devil come in and tear up a perfectly good work of God and take zealous people who were anxious to do things for the Lord and turn that zeal into stupidity. Those days have not all gone. There are many places where people start out with great zeal and it's been turned into riotous idiocy. Now, and it's been the occasion for demons to come in. Whereas before there was coldness and indifference, now there's flaming hot zeal and so anything goes. Both positions are wrong. You need the fires of the Holy Spirit and the love and the compassion of Jesus. But it needs to be tempered by your mind. You've got a head on your shoulders. Guess what? Your mind still works even if you haven't used it lately. Check it out. It will work. And God didn't set aside your mind and said, forget it, you don't need that thing anymore. He still uses it. He guides. It's not the determining factor, but it can guide. And you need the facts. Now, some people, some, there's some people who have a ministry of insanity. That's the nearest thing I can call it. They run around, you know, I have a word for you, brother. Oh, sister, I want to lay hands on you. Praise God, the multitudes are waiting for your ministry. And they're talking for, to some old billy goat here that is barely saved, needs to be scrubbed, washed, cleaned, and every which way. And he said, oh, the world's waiting for your ministry. And they said, oh, praise God, that's what I wanted to hear. I'll never have to work again. I'll just live off the folks. That's by faith, you know. 
That comes out of strict ignorance of the scriptures. You are to work. God has no patience whatsoever with slothfulness and laziness. Read the book of Proverbs. It'll teach you how to use your money. It'll teach you to save your money, and you better learn how because you're not going to have much. You haven't got much now. You're going to have a lot less in days coming. And Proverbs will also tell you what God thinks about lazy folks. I don't know how I'm going to get to my message. Uh, I will, though. You watch. I'll still. I'll fool you. I'll turn around the corner and there it'll be. My people act ugly sometimes. I'm preaching verse by verse through a passage. And they'll sit there and grin at me like they don't think I'm going to get past two verses. And there have been times when I didn't. And then there are other times when I surprise them. I make it around the corner and back. But seriously, people, you need to buckle down and be prepared to work. You need to be able to work in God's vineyard. There's too many of these, um, these young preachers and prophets that have been pulled green. You say, well, they told me this glorious vision. That was 20 years from now. Get to work and work toward it. How's that? I didn't have anybody lay hands on me when I was a young preacher. You say, well, see, that's you're jealous because nobody laid hands. No, I'm not. I was around some of those folks and they scared me. Because I had enough Bible that I knew what they were doing didn't, didn't add up to what I saw in the scriptures. They didn't run around slapping their hand on everybody they met in the Bible. We're to lay hands suddenly on no man. If I were you, I wouldn't let anybody lay hands suddenly on me either. You might give them your demons. You didn't expect that, did you? No, we've got to realize there's too much of this running to do God's word when you don't have anything to do. The classic example that's in the Old Testament. You remember when the battle was going forth, King David, his army was locked in battle with the enemy and out at the battlefront, the man in charge said, we've got to send a message to the king how the battle is going. There were two young men standing there. And one took off like a rabbit and he just flew to go to the king. The other young man stayed and found out what the general said. He said, you tell the king thus and thus and thus. Well, the fellow who took off got to the king first, and he, boy, he was fast. He was, oh, you talk about fleet foot, he was it. And he was there, <sighs> come from the battlefield, your majesty. <laughs> oh, that's all right, son, get your breath and tell me what, what is it. What's the message? Uh, uh, I forgot to get the message. Well, here comes old Leadfoot, you know. He's slow. He stayed to get the message. He took time to get ready for the job he was to do. He didn't take off and think he could do it all by himself. He comes running up. He's later. But the king said, step aside, Fleetfoot. You are empty head. You don't have anything to say. I want to hear what this man is. You have the message. Yes, sir, I have it. There are too many people start out running without the message. You won't get the message until you settle down and let God clean you up till you get into the Bible and have something to preach. It's going to take you a while to shake out all the false notions you've got. And you'll keep shaking them off for the rest of your life. Every once in a while you're going to run across an old cull that has to go. You say, well, I thought you could just get there all of a sudden. You've been listening to the wrong preachers. They're lying. They're not perfect. They just know how to pick your pocket. And see, you know, if if a pickpocket's good, they do it so slick you don't even know it's picked. And these boys on this electronic church are good at it. They pick your pocket and make you think it's great. They say, here, chicken, lay your neck down here and let me slice on it. And they say, yes, sir, how much you want to slice? Now, hold still. There, that didn't hurt much, did it? Now, come back next week and we'll take another pint. What a bunch of nunus, gullible gooses. 
And a lot of people run around here, you know, they say, Oh, God told me. God didn't tell you anything, most likely. You need to get that book, God Told Me to Tell You. That'll put a stop to a lot of this foolishness. Written by a good old assembly God preacher down in Texas. I mean, he laid her in the shade. You read Faith Brokers, that'll help you too. That'll straighten out some kinks in your thinking. There's a lot of foolish things passing off for truth that are not truth. And, there, and one of the most foolish things that's, are, that's running around today is that a Christian cannot have a demon. I've had people come up in here and in the meetings, and, and I say, uh, did you want prayer for deliverance? Well, yes, somebody told me I had a demon wrapped around my leg, and one wrapped around my arm, and another one around my shoulder. You know what I tell them? I said, let's don't worry about those on the outside. They're not going to bother you that much. I'm concerned about those big boys on the inside. <laughs> oh, but I don't have any inside because you understand, I'm under the blood. I said, me too. And you got them. Had one missionary lady show up here one time. She made a dreadful mistake. I happened to be down there helping take care of the people in front. I was down on the floor that day. She came up and she wanted uh, healing, I think it was. And I said, well, uh, I said something about demons. Oh, I don't have any of those. I said, you don't? No. Uh, I said, well, just go along with us. We're going to pray this way. Well, no, I was over to brother so-and-so, you know, and he does it so-and-so. I said, fine, then you don't need prayer. Move. We had about 30, 40 left in line already. Well, she said, she she did the putt-putt all the way to the wall over there. There was a man back in the control room. I had a microphone on. He said, I nearly died of embarrassment, and you weren't even talking to me. I said, well, the arrogance of that woman coming up and trying to instruct somebody how to get rid of her demons. She's so full of them. Pride was wrapped all around her because it couldn't all get inside. Paul said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I betroth you to one husband. I want you to keep yourself for Jesus Christ and him alone. I don't want you messing around with the devil and his, his bunch over here. I don't want them leading you astray. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled, cast a spell on Eve through his subtlety. As the serpent used witchcraft on Eve. And that's what they're doing. You know, they talk about Dave Hunt. You know, he gets a lot of flack. Well, we don't much believe in what Dave Hunt says because he's creating division in the body. He didn't create it, he uncovered it. How can light and darkness mix? You can't use witchcraft things. And let me tell you this, after 18 years in deliverance, we can vouch for the truth of what Dave Hunt says in his books about various things. And let me tell you one other thing a lot of people don't know. John Ankerberg offered every person in Seduction of Christianity the opportunity to come on his show and to face Dave Hunt. And Dave Hunt agreed to face them and sit down and talk over it openly on TV nationwide. And not one solitary one showed up except the silver mind control man showed up and Dave made a monkey out of him. But not one of those screaming little... Innocent people that got hit, not one of them showed up. Not one came in to say, well, let me set you straight. And Ankerberg offered them free time, and not one of them came. You know why? Because there's no defense for what they're doing. They are dabbling with dark arts just because it works, and they don't want to admit it. Now, some of you look like, I've offended your delicacy. Well, you stick around here, you'll get more offended than that. I am sick and tired of God's people being milked. And you say, but these things work. Well, I never have said witchcraft didn't work. But I know that it, God hates it. It is defiling. It is incredibly filthy and vile. And God hates every expression of it. And the biggest laugh the devil has up his sleeve is to deceive people. And I'm not saying that the people involved in this even know what they're doing. But they need to stop and check it out. If they'll check, they'll find out. They have underestimated the enemy and that is a deadly blunder. That's a tactical error which will lead to defeat. Now... 
He said, I don't want your minds to be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. They're always going after new revelations, grand revelations. I have to go to E.W. Kenyon stuff where he says that Jesus died spiritually, went to hell, had to be born again. Lies, lies, heresy of the worst sort. And Copeland, Hagen, uh, the Copenhagens and everybody that follows them is going that right. It leads straight into the manifest sons of God, which is open heresy and defiance of God. There's some good people caught in it. I know some. I like the people. I hate what they're teaching. And I'd, be, I'd not be true to God if I didn't sound the alarm in Zion and tell you to stay with the simplicity of the scriptures. Don't go after revelations. Go after Jesus Christ. Understanding him, living for him, being what he wants you to be, where you are. Don't worry about taking the world. He'll do that himself if you'll get in line. This deliverance ministry, the concepts and the precepts that God gave us here at Hagwish about deliverance have spread across this nation up into Canada, down into the Caribbean and other nations, and across the seas. And many thousands and thousands of people, we won't know until we get to heaven, how many people have been set free and blessed, and yet we don't have a single organization to set it up and to push it. This is the biggest organization you'll see right here. These 160 members, resident members here. That's it. Did you know Hagris is that small? Now I wrote my book, first book, a tiny church on the south side of Chicago. When people used to come in, they'd say, but it's so little. I said, that's what I said. They said, but I couldn't believe it was so little and all this was happening there. I said, I didn't lie. I said it was little. It still is. We've got to get away from this idea that big is good. It depends on what it is. If you're burying dead bodies, I'd rather bury a dead gnat than a dead elephant any day. <laughs> and there's a bunch of old dead elephants laying around stinking up the place. It'd be better if they were gnats. If they're going to die anyhow. Listen, God never has needed the, the, the movements of men. He just needs men and women to fall in love with Jesus and go out to do the works of Jesus, being used of him, not jumping ahead of him, not running ahead of him, but just flowing with him and being busy doing their work where they are. God has always picked people to go out. You say, I'm going to the mission field. Why? Well, somebody came up and laid their hands on me. Wait. Listen, look in the Bible. Go to the Bible. They didn't go out that way. Gideon was threshing grain in a cave for his family. He was working in a land that was occupied by enemy soldiers. He was trying to get enough food together to feed his family. And when they came and told him, Hello, General Gideon, he nearly, his teeth nearly fell out of his mouth. And he didn't want to go. At the burning bush, when God spoke to Moses, he didn't want to go. The very fact that you're jumping up and down means you're not ready. The fact that you think you're God's gift to the world means you're a long way from being ready. <laughs> you're going to have to realize that you're nothing. And Jesus is everything. You're going to have to realize that God has to open those doors. You can't push a single one of them open. That's not your job. You walk up to him and say, is this it, Lord? If he doesn't open the door, okay. Then I won't go through. You say, Lord, you've got to make a way. I cannot do this. If you'll do that, there's no limit to what God will do with you. I'm trying to get to this fourth verse. I made it. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus that we've not preached, another Jesus that died and went to hell, and got born again, that's another Jesus. Another Jesus, the one hanging on the crucifix, that's another Jesus. That's not the one in the Bible. Another Jesus, the one who is the beloved master from Galilee, who walked through the lovely hills of Galilee, and he preached good news to the people, and he said, if you don't repent to a certain extent, you might be damned. <laughs> There's a bunch of molly coddling stuff like that going on too. Another Jesus. There are a lot of people preaching another Jesus. 
Jesus told me to build a great worldwide thing to feed the children in India. Why don't you go there and convince those Hindus to kill those cows and eat them and the grain they fill and you feed India automatically. It's their demon gods and demon worship starving them to death. It's the worship of demon gods and the judgment of God on those lands. You're not going to repeal it. You say, huh, you don't care about those starving children? Yes, I do. But you're not going to stop it single-handedly. You can go out and get a bunch of gullible gooses all weepy and teary, bring all their money to you so you can drive off in a Mercedes to win them. Mm-hmm. Listen. You better look and see what God is saying. Like the old boy is out in the, uh, on the farm. I told you about him before. Farm boy, he's out there and he's plowing a mule. And up, he happened to look up in the sky. And the clouds formed and made a big P. See, he got so excited, he ran off and left the mule. Ran back to the house. And, he just, and his daddy said, son, what are you doing here? Are you supposed to be out there working? He said, oh, God, oh, father, look, dad, look. Look over there in the sky. PC, preach Christ, preach Christ. I can't plow anymore. I've got to preach Christ. He said, look again, son. He says, plow corn, plow corn. <laughs> There's too many of these boys running around all be plowing corn. If God wants you to preach, he'll put you in the place. You get busy and work with your hands. Well, I can't do that because I'm dedicated. Well, then you're a lazy slough and you need to be starved out. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians. He said, he that's able-bodied and won't work shouldn't eat. Now, one way or the other, you get rid of the lazy ones. They'll either die or they'll go to work. Either way, you're better off. We picked up a sick mentality in this age. A lot of Christians think they're soft-hearted. They're just soft-headed. You're not supposed to. You say, well, I was supposed to give to my brother. Everybody you meet is not your brother. There's a lot of them walking around disguised. The devil's got a bunch of them walking around disguised like your brother. And they'll drain you of everything. You're supposed to do what Jesus said. Man, I don't want to get started on that. Another Jesus. Or if you receive another spirit. Oh, how is this possible? No, no, no. If you receive another spirit than the one you received, they'd receive the Holy Spirit. That meant they were saved, right? When you receive Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. He goes into your spirit. And as a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ at that instant. You said, I didn't know that. I didn't either for years. I was safe in the body of Christ while I was worried about wondering if I could fall out. And I was locked in for eternity and didn't even know it. And when I found out, you think I didn't enjoy it? You bet I'm still enjoying it. If you're still trying to hang on, no, just keep hanging on. Be like the little old man who took the airplane ride. You know, somebody said, you've never been up on an airplane here? A little old two-place plane said, we got a pilot. We'll pay him. You take him up and take him around for a ride. The old gentleman came back down. They got out and he said, well, how'd you like it? And he said, well, I guess it's all right. Of course, I never did let all my weight down on that seat. <laughs> that poor old man had circled that entire flight, holding up. He couldn't relax and enjoy the flight. Now, the pilot was sitting there all relaxed, just looking out and everything else. This poor guy was like this. He was so tired when he got there. He didn't know what to do. I think when some people get to heaven, they're going to be so tired. They'll say, where's the bed? I want to rest. I'm so tired. I've been holding out faithful to the end. It's just about wore me out. Friend, you can rest. Jesus is holding. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether you understand the theology of it, it has nothing to do with what he's doing. He's holding on. He said, if you receive another spirit which you've not received, that means you can. Why would Paul say if you have received a spirit when you couldn't? I'll take his word against any of these Johnny Jerkups that have come along. These preachers pull green off the tree. They need to write them quite a while longer. By the way, if you go around and you think you've got super spiritual knowledge, you say, oh, God's telling me you're supposed to preach. Shut your mouth. 
All you'll do, you say, well, I felt so strong that they're supposed to preach. Well, if that's right, then God showed you that so you could pray about it, not so you could flip your jaws about it. All you'll do is confuse that person. Now, I've seen some uh, women said somebody came up and told them this called to preach. Well, I know they're wrong. Because God didn't call her to preach. No, ma'am. I beg your pardon. It isn't in the scriptures. We just don't accept it. Well, I'm a preacher. Well, you're wrong. And you think you're clocking up rewards and you're clocking up rebellion. Check it out. It's not there. Until you can be the husband of one wife and be the head of house scripturally, you cannot Amen. occupy the preacher. You can prophesy. You can minister deliverance. You can pray. You can win people to the Lord. There are many, many things you can minister to the Lord gloriously. But you are not called up there. You are deceived. Now I made some real enemies. There goes Worley again. I'm telling you what the scripture says. Talk to my wife. She says any woman would be a fool to try to be a preacher. You don't know what you're asking for. You're not built for it. It's going to tear you to pieces, tear your family up. You say, well, I'm the preacher. My husband won't come to church. I don't blame him. I'd be ashamed too. (laughs) That's right. It's wrong. I finally found out Marilyn Hickey had a husband the other day. I was shocked. Poor thing. Bless her heart. Hmm. I don't talk about that. Is it still the Marilyn Hickey Ministries? She's running around everywhere. Gathering up all the women she can find. Friend, it's wrong. The Bible does not so teach. And one of the reasons the church is weak is because we're not observing what God said in his word. Check it out. Check it out. Women are not to assume authority over men. Well, that was Paul's idea. I'll take his idea over any of these Jake legs running around today trying to repeal it. Tromley wrote a book here a while back. Who said women? couldn't teach. Well, I don't know why he had to write a book about it. Paul said it. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Which Mr. Tromley didn't have when he wrote that book. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't talk out of both sides of his mouth. You say, well, Paul could be wrong. He could be. But I'll tell you one thing. He stayed in line with scriptures there. Well, I just believe there's neither male nor female when it comes to salvation. You're right. When it comes to other things, you're wrong. The scripture is very clear about it. When Abraham was called by God and said, get thee up and get thee out, he didn't say, Sarah, what do you think about us going? (laughs) Nowhere in the scriptures. It's always. He said, well, what about Deborah? She never fought. She rode out because that stinking... Uh, Jephthah, well, what is his name? Wouldn't fight. I can't remember his name because he makes me want to spit. Barak, yeah. She didn't fight, though. She rode out with him, but she didn't fight. Check it out. She had more sense than some. All right. Um, another spirit. Another spirit. You can receive another spirit. And people have received them by the bukus. You say, how many is a buku? A whole lot. That's a whole lot. That's an old southern expression for just barrels full. Or another gospel which you've not accepted, you might well bear with him. There have a lot of gospels running around. We've got a lot of ways to get saved running around today. The Bible hasn't changed at all. And Paul said, I don't want the devil to get you away from the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. The word of God is not that complicated. It's not that difficult. It doesn't need new revelations. It just needs obedience. To obey is what? Better than sacrifice. To hearken better than fat ram. You say, well, I still don't see how a born-again believer could have a demon. You don't. Over in Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 15. Jesus is questioning his disciples. And he'd ask them what the people that were listening to him said, who they said he was. And they gave the answers the people were saying. 
And then he said, but whom do you say? Whom say ye that I am? Verse 15. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now notice what Jesus said. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter had become a vessel of honor through which the Heavenly Father spoke a truth that Peter could not have known any other way. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I think the pronouncement even shocked him a little bit. Because the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, told him what to say. Now, so Peter is standing here as a vessel, meat for the master's use. And he is, he goes on and says, I'll say to you that you're Peter. And the word Peter is Petra, little pebble. And then he says, upon this mighty mountain, the word rock is a huge cliff. It's not the same as Petra. Petra is a pebble. So he couldn't have built it on pebble, Simon Pebble. He built it on the great rock or the great cliff. Now, what, was, what did he build it on? What is the rock? The rock is Peter's divinely given confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this... The confession that came by God's Holy Spirit through Peter. On this, he said, I'll build my church. Not on Peter. Peter wobbled all over the place. He's just like us. But on the rock of his confession that was divinely given. That flesh and blood had not revealed. He said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Whoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's not talking about the Pope. He didn't get them. That's, the keys are the, the power, the authority to bind on earth and loose on earth. To bind on earth and to loose things in heaven. Now, you go down a little bit further... And then Jesus begins to tell them, I'm going to die shortly. I'm going to suffer many things. And he was, he was getting them ready for Calvary because it's not too far away. Verse 22, the one who had the revelation, Simon Barjona, apostle first class, steps up and he said, Now, Lord, I know you're wrought up. You're probably upset. And it's a good thing I'm here to straighten you out. Because you're mistaken. He said, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. One of the translations says, have pity on yourself, O Lord. Do you know what self-pity is? It's a demonic force. Let a self-pity demon come in on pity yourself, Lord. Now, Peter turned and said... Thank you, Peter. I don't know what in the world caused me to get off track like that. No, he didn't. Although this was the man who had been the vessel God used to speak through. This was a vessel, meat for the master's use. And God had spoken the revelation through him. Now, Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Ouch. Peter has gotten so carried away with his revelatory gifts. Uh, and he had a genuine one, didn't he? Was the gift real? Did it come from God? You bet. Did that mean he would not make a mistake here? No, it did not. He made a big blunder. Satan tickled his ear and said, It's about time for you to help the Lord out. He's in a bind. He's saying things that shouldn't be. And Jesus stopped him short. And he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest. You don't smell like the things of God. You stink like the things of men. Why? Because an evil spirit had come into that man. And an evil spirit said to him, Pity yourself, Lord. Pity yourself. 
How could that be? Very easily. You say, oh, but, but that, oh, you don't understand, Pastor? But you've, you've forgotten that's before Pentecost. Sure was. Guess what? First Corinthians was after Pentecost. If you receive another spirit which you've not received. And when Peter, after Peter made that marvelous confession, he did receive another spirit, an evil spirit, which attempted to head off the Lord. And Jesus didn't put up with it. He put a stop to it. That means that even people who are greatly gifted, if they don't watch their step, the enemy can get in and say things through them that are wrong. And I'll tell you something else. Once that thing begins, the era begins, and there are religious teaching spirits. Um, let me give you some scriptures to jot down. We're not have time to look, look them up. My clock started running fast a while ago. Um, <coughs> Well, of course, deliverance is a children's bread. You know about that in Matthew 15, 27 and Mark 7, 28. Um, you knew about, uh, doubtless you know about 1 Timothy 4, 1. And that's the one that talks about religious teaching spirits. Did you know the demons have a teaching program? They're good at it, too. They're convincing. And they use every manipulation possible to throw people for a loop. And they'll throw you for a loop if you're listening. You've got to tune in to what God is saying. Mark 16, 15 and 17. You know those familiar passages. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. When you believe, what's the next step? Cast out devils. Those who believe, in my name shall they cast out devils. They said they might, said they will. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. All of these things are predicated by Jesus Christ. Why cast out demons if they're not there? Why did he say do it? And what do you think's happening? What do you think happened here last night? You think those people all made that up? You think we paid all those people to come in here and scream and holler and, and uh, beat the uh, floor? If you're sitting around some of these pews... And you see the wood split on them? You think we paid people to come in and split those pews and lift them up off the floor and rip them loose from their anchors? And do things they couldn't do? You think we pay them to come and throw us across the room? <laughs> Wake up. They are, they are, demons are real. They are very real. And you and I had better not forget it. It's time for us to recognize the enemy is powerful. He's strong. He's very able to attack, and he will. And he's most effective when he attacks from within. You say, oh, well, then I'm going to run up and get delivered. Exodus 23, 27 through 30 will tell you how it's done. When we first got in deliverance, I thought, oh, my lands. I know you have to stay on Scripture if you're going to stay straight with God. Where are the Scriptures on fighting demons? Jesus tossed him out. He said we had to do it. How do you do it? He didn't tell us. The, the accounts are sketchy. And as we began to move into it, I began, I said, Lord, where's the answers? Where's the answers? I looked for the books. There weren't any. There just weren't any books there. There were several years before there was any books that had anything about deliverance, the mountain thing. And there still aren't many books that are wor worth reading. But I finally found out that the Psalms are the war. That's the handbook. And the Old Testament, the dealings of God with Israel, give you the warfare patterns. And as you begin to understand those things, you begin to see how it's done. And God is going to throw the demons out by little and by little because you couldn't stand it. You threw them all out. If we could get you free and give you a certificate completely clean of demons, certified, Signed, Pastor Winmerly. You can't get much higher than that. Uh, <laughs> I'll even put a stamp on it, seal. You are pure. You are holy. You wouldn't get out the door until you'd be full of them again. 
You know why? Because you'd be so puffed up. Well, I'm clean. I'm not like these other folks. I've had my deliverance. Have you ever seen some of these folks that had seven demons cast out or six demons cast out and they're all delivered? They're the most pathetic ones I know about. They are bad because they don't know how bad off they are. They don't know that we've got layers of these things. They think because they peeled off a layer or two, they've got them all. You haven't even uncovered the big boys. There was a man who has been here a good while the other day. And last two or three weeks, something stirred up in him two or three times. It sounds like some kind of a cross between a wild tiger, a roaring lion, and a Tyrannosaurus. I never heard of Tyrannosaurus, but it sounds like I would think one would sound. I mean, it sounds like an animal. It's also very, very strong. And that man's had a lot of deliverance. But it's just now unearthing, getting down into there where the real bad part is. Did you ever have a dentist digging your teeth? I can just see your teeth going, <laughs> you know, that one that goes, you know. Now everybody's awake because they're thinking, oh, don't say that anymore. Uh, and they go down in there and they have to get all that stuff out. And by the way, don't you just hate it when a dentist, you sit down in a dentist's chair and you got these perfectly good fillings. They're not hurting. And he takes this great big old wire hook that looks like it could pull a, side, a piece of siding off of a house. And he hooks it in there and tries his best to pull those things loose. And you think, don't do that. <laughs> if you pull them loose, we'll have to replace them. I don't want them replaced. I just want them, you to say they're okay. But you know, you've got to dig way down deep in there sometimes before you get really where the main problem is. It takes a while to drill. And some people, because they've had a little minor drilling, oh, now I'm all right. Or because the wire hook is pulled a few times, they think, well, I'm through. Mm -mm. You're going to have to drill deep and find out where that real nest is down in there, the real power structure of evil. And don't think the demons haven't anticipated having to fight off the attacks of the workers. You're going to have to come and be submissive to the Lord and say, Lord, I've got, I need help. Get them. When I came for prayer, nothing happened. Well, get yourself ready, and they will. You're going to have to do it if you're going to get free. There, isn't, there are no two ways about it, three ways, ten ways. You've simply got to keep coming. You say, well, nothing happened. Well, keep coming till it does. Amen? Because they're in there. Otherwise, you'd be well nigh perfect. All the religious remedies you've tried. I mean, you'd be so religious you couldn't touch the floor with your feet. Get delivered during these days. Open your heart and listen. Learn as much as you can. The more you learn, the easier it's going to be to uproot these things. That's the reason some of you are already boiling, kind of like a volcano, going bloop, 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 bloop. And just bind them up, bind them up. They're marinating. Good for them. Good for them. Makes them easier to get out. Just let them marinate. They'll be tender. And then when the workers go in after them, they'll, they'll have to yield. So don't get discouraged. Praise God.